All right, so this is just a very cool <laughs> topic. <laughs> Weapons of text, dist uh, what is it, destruction. Right. Okay. <laughs> Oh, is it? Oh, is it heckling time? Because I'm feeling very, very Simon Cowell today, okay? You know, I haven't slept in 48 hours. There we go. No, it was like 72, right? You this know what? It, it's been 7,000 hours since I've slept. It was 80,000 bubble hours. 87 bubble. <laughs> All right. I don't know. So with drunk. that, we're going to move on to the next talk. This is Jared um, this is Stroud. Sorry, I'm like. There's plenty of room up front. Come on. Come on up. Come on. Like in the past year, my eyesight's just become shot, so I can't see close-up stuff anymore. Well, go to the doctor and get a new pair of glasses. That would help. Yeah. Maybe I should get new glasses. All right. So weapons of text destruction. This is just a really cool talk, and I'm gonna let Jared talk about it. So, Thank Jared. You. Thank you. So, so peanut galleries can be a detriment or a positive, depending on how well or bad they behave. Or I'm just letting you know. They bring. Oh, how many so bribes they have. There's yeah. like a lot of them. Yeah, we have they, a lot of potential. Have. Right off the bat, I want to thank Chris Tran for giving me a laptop that works. So uh, <laughs> thanks, Chris Tran. <laughs> All right. And uh, without further delay, hopefully everything works, and we'll go into weapons of text destruction. And next slide. Oh, fantastic. So let's uh, go through the motivation of uh, why we're talking. So we're going to go through the motivation of this talk of why we're talking about how to use Vim for offensive purposes, because that's kind of an absurd concept to begin with. Uh, then we're going to go ahead and talk about some uh, sneaky code execution, some persistence avenues via Vim, uh, some Vim script and how to kind of automate some things through Vim, and some native encryption using just Vim. So as much as possible, unless otherwise noted, everything is going to be done just in Vim because uh, it's kind of a neat thing to do. So the motivation for this talk uh, really came out of uh, some uh, collegiate attack defend competitions. I'm fortunate enough to be on a couple uh, red team uh, uh, competitions where you have college students that uh, go into a network they've never seen before and they have to defend these systems against industry professionals that are acting as a red team. So, as you might think, um, it's usually, uh, you know, it's a back and forth of they find us, we get kicked out, we get back in, we have to find unique ways to stay. And uh, the lovely No Starch Press book, POC or GTFO, has an excellent uh, chapter called a, uh, a Parable on the Importance of Tools. And basically what this breaks down is, you know, there are plenty of awesome open source offensive utilities out there, but what if you're in a situation where you can't bring those into that environment? and you're really just left with like some bubble gum and rubber bands and you have to MacGyver your situation into something successful. So that kind of got me uh, thinking through this. And then also uh, Will Schroeder gave a talk, uh, a fire talk a couple years ago called Offense in Depth. And it was, uh, or excuse me, gave a talk uh, about hunting sysadmins and he had a quote called uh, Offense in Depth and just knowing other ways around the system. So that's, that's kind of where we are, we're going with this. Whoa. So the only assumption that we're going to make through this whole thing is that you have a Linux machine and that Vim is installed on it. Everything else we're going to go through and I'll point out if there's any other discrepancies. Uh, everything that you're going to see in the screenshots was done on uh, Ubuntu uh, desktop 18.04. Uh, if my laptop would have worked, we would have done live demos, uh, but unfortunately, here we are, so we'll just deal with the screenshots. So this is incredibly tiny and you probably can't read it. Uh, Starting off, we have to ask ourselves, so what can Vim do for us? And what I mean by that is what, what plugins are uh, installed with your version of Vim? What subsystems do you have available to you? So if you do Vim tac tac version, it's going to print out everything that it was compiled with or what your binary has. So the things that are going to be immediately interesting to us, again, something you can't see, is Python and Python 3, right? So this is implying that we can actually uh, invoke uh, Python commands from Vim, which is pretty cool from both uh, an offensive point of view, but also a developer point of view. Personally, if I, if I can just stay in Vim all the time, I am the happiest man in the world. So uh, this kind of leads us into some of the other capabilities of Vim. 
So uh, is, if you're familiar with Metasploit's uh, resource files where you can script a bunch of uh, post exploitation commands, so as soon as you get that shell, you uh, run git system or you run git uh, persistence, uh, et cetera, whatever your favorite commands are. Uh, it allows you to kind of automate what you're trying to do there. And Vim has a uh, similar concept with their normal mode. So in normal mode, that's all of your nice uh, muscle memory hotkeys that you have in Vim to do like batch text editing and process several text files at once. So Vim comes with this nice little thing where you can do tacw key.log or whatever file name you want it and it'll log every single uh, uh, keystroke that you write to a file that you're currently editing. That sounds kind of like a key logger to me. You're supposed to be able to reload those normal commands and execute them against a batch of files. However, it logs more than just what you type in normal mode. It logs what you type in insert mode. So if you were to alias this on someone's machine or you put it in someone's vimrc, you will absolutely be logging all of that content to a, uh, a file that you can later exfiltrate off the device. That's pretty cool. Again, live demo would have been neat, but go ahead and try it out right now and let me know how it goes for you. Okay, so moving on from key loggers, right? So we're feeling pretty good there. We can start there and let's uh, figure out how some more uh, uh, sneakier things we can do with Vim. As I said before, with Vim dash dash version, you're going to be able to see what uh, pr supported languages you have that you can invoke through Vim. So off the bat, you usually have Perl, Ruby, Python 2 and 3, uh, Tickle Scripts, as well as Lua. So with uh, Vim uh, and Ubuntu 1804, you're going to have Python 3 and I believe Python two, uh, and just, just Python 3 support. With that, you can do a lot of really interesting things. So going forward. So if we were to execute like a normal Python script, let's just say like a hello world, right? Uh, you're going to see over here, hello world in a while true loop, it prints out as we expect. And let's say you're auditing a system for some suspicious, uh, suspicious behavior as the blue teamers do in all of the competitions. And you're grepping for Python. You're going to go ahead and see that test.py just pop up and you go, all right, so if it's not test.py, it's evil.py, et cetera. We don't know what this is. Let's prosecute further. Let's get them off the machine, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's the typical cat and mouse game that we see uh, in these competitions. But what if we can go ahead and just not show up in the process list, but maybe you see Vim running in the process list, a little less conspicuous. And uh, that is actually what you can achieve through normal mode in Vim where you do this py3 file up here. So py3 file, as you would expect, uh, will invoke uh, uh, Python 3 and then, it, or excuse me, yeah, it'll run Python 3 and then whatever your file name is, it'll execute that Python script. So in the top image there, we're going to go ahead and run and load test.py. And in the bottom here, I have a nice little tmux session kind of cut across there. You see hello world getting print into where you would normally type in your command modes, but you don't <laughs> see Python in the process list, right? That's pretty neat. So you might be asking like, well, what does this look like further? How do you do this? Uh, well, uh, Python actually offers uh, bindings for C and C++ right on their actual official documentation. You can go ahead and grab that snippet of code and use that to run individual uh, Python files. So Vim is actually leveraging this. So Vim embeds uh, Python itself and links against it. You can find it in those uh, source directories right there. And uh, it never invokes the Python interpreter directly. It does load the Python share, or the lib Python shared object uh, to execute these, but uh, it will never, you'll never see the Python and then the blah uh, file. That's pretty cool, because I have a couple pretty neat Python scripts that we like to use in these competitions, so if I can say it out of the process list, looks pretty good to me. So back to what we were talking about before about the, uh, the dynamic loading or the static loading depending on your version of Python. So this thing's really important. So for the blue teamers in the room from a collegiate standpoint or for just those that are interested, you might say like, oh, okay, well, what does this like look like? How do I find these artifacts of uh, Vim that's actually executing Python? Great question. So depending on the way that your version of Vim was compiled, you're either going to statically load that, Pyth that lib Python SO every time, which is what you see up at the top there, or you will dynamically load it when you actually invoke uh, uh, the Py3 file and whatever your file name is. From a memory map point of view, if you grab the PID and cat the, uh, so your proc PID maps and then you grep for Python, you would see libpython3 if it was uh, loaded. So if it's statically loaded, it's always going to be there and you're always going to see this, right? So that doesn't really indicate to you whether Python's actually getting executed on your machine or not. However, if it's dynamically loaded, then you're going to know, well, I don't execute Python from Vim because that's a little weird for me, so we shouldn't see that up there. 
So a little bit of blue teaming uh, for uh, that point of view. But uh, going one more, right? So like if we're already going down this track of like, all right, maybe Python's getting, maybe Python's getting extra th through Vim or not. How can we uh, find more Vim artifacts? Which is kind of like an absurd thing to think about. But everything that you're going to be executing in Vim is going to stay in Vim info. This includes command line history, search history, uh, buffer list, your marks for your files, everything. So that is a great point to start if you're looking for uh, uh, potentially what a user has done on a device. Additionally, if you do this colon browse old files, which you know doesn't look really cool, and I'm just telling you guys this, but it will show a list of recently opened files with Vim that also gets stored in Vim info. So if you stumble across your machine, as uh, the previous speakers were saying, like you came back to your machine, there's just a terminal open, who's there? And for some reason, you're like, you know what? Bet they used Vim, messed with something. <laughs> if you open Vim and do colon browse old files, by all means, you're going to see a nice little list of recently edited files. So this can start piecing together uh, a nice little. Uh, uh, puzzle path for you to figure out uh, what's been happening in the Vim environment. Okay, so we talked about key logging with Vim, we talked about executing Python with Vim, and uh, then some ways to what that looks like from a blue, t uh, blue teamer's point of view. So now we're going to talk about persistence via Vim. It is no surprise to anyone in this room or anyone who has ever used Vim that your Vim RC gets executed when you load Vim, right? So by default, that's going to be a great place just to put whatever you want to execute it. Uh, if VimRC is not there and you can, uh, or you don't want to put it there for these, some of these competitions where you think that they might get audited, XRC is what the uh, leftover from the VI commands for config files. Vim will load that if it can't find VimRC. Also, you have uh, plenty of places to load plugins and uh, place your own uh, malicious plugins and, and really do whatever you want. Going further, there is also a similar concept of like an LD preload path. Uh, so if you see the top uh, right here, you'll see the Vim runtime. So you can actually go ahead and say like, hey, I actually want you to look over here in this directory for all my plugins. So you can load your super cool uh, Golang complete uh, plugin or whatever you might have. So there's a, there's a lot of interesting ways that you can modify the Vim environment to your <coughs> advantage as a red teamer. So, Tin foil hat time. Uh, how often do you audit your VimRC? Or do you just want it so when you hit tab, the Python tabs four lines and it's fine, and when you're editing YAML files, there's not a bunch of crazy stuff going on, so you grab some guy's Vim off of uh, GitHub and you throw it in there and it goes, oh, this worked, I'm gonna move on with my life, right? So uh, these plugins are absolutely executing code, and when you do sudo vim, again, you're executing privileged code. So understanding uh, what's in your plugins directory and what is in your VimRC and if your path's been messed with is uh, super important, especially uh, as how easy and inconspicuous it might look. So VimScript is a full-fledged Vim scripting language. So you can do a bunch of very unique things in here that will make your life easier from somebody that wants to edit a bunch of text files to, hey, I want these color schemes to, hey, here's a new programming language that you might be working on for a project and you want it to look like this in the syntax highlighting. Uh, this is the default path where VimRC is going to get loaded. So this is just something to keep in mind uh, if you are going to kind of play with the idea of uh, sticking something malicious in the, uh, the VimRC. But, uh, but uh, doing a really simple persistence example, right? So we're just going to have a function here in VimScript called persist. We're going to call a VimScript function called, uh, which is executable. So basically, this is going ahead and take that string, bin evil, say, like, is this executable? If it's not and it doesn't exist, then let's go ahead and execute silently. So don't do anything to standard out or standard error, this bash one liner, which is just a curl command. So what we're doing here, right, we're combining Vim script with some outside system commands, and we already know that we can launch Python with Vim, so you can combine all of these things and start building really interesting toolkits if you think about it. Because if you can execute Python without showing up in the process list, hey, that's already, you know, scratching off low-hanging fruit. And then if you can call external commands and then embed them in uh, through a modular approach with uh, Vim script, then you can really start making really complex utilities. So again, this is a simple example here. I'm sure everyone has their favorite way to persist on a uh, Linux machine. By all means, you can swap that out. So the next thing we're going to do is dive a little bit deeper into VimScript because there's a lot of really interesting uh, native Vim functionality that I find a lot of people are unaware of. 
such as native ROT13 support. <laughs> Woohoo! So, I knew that. <laughs> in these attack defend competitions, towards the end of the competition, we like to have a little bit more fun with the blue, uh, the blue team, and we uh, tend to have like a scorched earth approach in about the last hour. So something that's real fun to do is uh, watching a bunch of undergrads open files and you just see a bunch of gibberish and they're a little confused too as why. So if you look over here, I don't know, this looks absolutely atrocious to see. So sorry about that, but uh, over here basically what we're gonna do is execute in normal mode um, a string of commands that will take us to the top of the file, pop us in visual mode, highlight to the bottom of the file and run rot13 on the first 100 characters. So you could append as many zeros to that as you want, and then it'll also right quit the file. So this function pwn, you throw in your vimrc, whatever file you opened, we just route 13 it and wrote it to disk. Fun. Yeah. Would have been cooler with a demo, but Arch Linux, am I right? So that's, uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna go a little bit further now and uh, also talk about encryption support via vim. So again. Vim supports uh, editing encrypted files out of the box. So what do I mean by that? So Vim supports uh, three cipher suites, Blowfish 2, Blowfish, and uh, pzip, and it's all native built into Vim. So this is not Vim tiny, again, this is like pseudo apt get install Vim. All right, I have, I have full Vim on my machine. So knowing that we have uh, <laughs> encryption methods we can call, I wonder if there's a way that we can just go ahead and call those on random files, maybe chain it together with some Vim script stuff, and uh, potentially do it in batch. And yes, there is. So there is also a headless execution mode. Why would you do that for batch processing? So what this command will do is it'll go ahead and the E stands for the uh, X mode, C is the command, and we're going to take that string there, we're gonna set our CM, our cipher method, to blowfish2, those pipes that you're seeing, those are actually Vim script command separators, so think of those as like a uh, semicolon in bash. We're gonna go ahead and set the key to admin admin, and then we're gonna go ahead and do write quit, and then we're gonna open resolve.conf, and then we're going to encrypt that file, write it to disk, call it a day. So obviously this is gonna show up in the bash history, so clear that out, but throw this in a for loop, <laughs> throw this in a for loop against a directory of files, and you can start uh, really having fun with the uh, end users. So when, back to the Vim native support uh, for uh, encryption, so when you go to open these files with Vim, you'll actually get this nice little prompt which goes, hey, you need an encryption key. How does it know this? With a nice little custom header. So Vimcrypt will go ahead and dump this header to the start of all the files and it'll uh, specify 03 for Blowfish 2, 02 for Blowfish, and 01 for pzip. That's pretty neat. As you can see, you can combine all of these things together and get really complex functions and do really interesting things with just Vim. So, future ideas, why not expand that to Emacs? There's at least, oh, uh, no. there's at least no. one Emacs no. user in the crowd, no. and I think it's that guy right there. No. Uh, the slides are available, because I know that this is like super terrible to read on these screens, so uh, please uh, uh, leave comments or uh, come talk to me, whatever you want to do. Uh, <laughs> questions? Yeah. 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 Yeah, we're running a little behind schedule, so um, no questions right now, but, well, hold on, just one question, go ahead. As a sysadmin, I hate you. As a sysadmin, I hate you. What's the comment? What's the comment? So I've been told there's been some sacrifices for the bribes, so we have some bribe sacrifices, <laughs> sacrifice bribes, I don't know what that is. Um, so you mentioned college competitions, which, which one specifically, CCDC? Uh, yes, MACCDC specifically, and then also uh, at Rochester Institute of Technology, there's a competition. <laughs> so I also want to mention, uh, since he brought up CCDC, there's another college competition that some of you may or may not know about called CPTC. College penet uh, Collegiate Penetration Testing Championship. So if you want to do red, if you want to be on the red team instead of the blue team, check that one out. All right, um, I'm glad you had a uh, backup for your live demo. That's very key whenever you're doing a talk, right? But I'm gonna, I'm minusing you a million points for your small font. Hey, and I'm minusing you. I'm gonna minus you another million points. 
for your red text on a black background. Okay, I know there's screenshots, but most terminals can have a font size and you can choose it and then take your screenshot. I'm an old guy, I'm sitting 10 feet from this 20 foot screen, I still can't read the damn things. Other than, other, uh, other than that, it's a very interesting talk, very useful, uh, awesome shit. I was told to make it shorter to make up time, so all I have to say is, why bother with Emacs tabs versus spaces, man? Seriously. Uh, one small thing, thank you for talking about how tools aren't the answer. Too many pen testers have absolutely no freaking clue. They think they can go into any environment, throw everything they ever saw on GitHub or heard in a talk, and they're gonna be able to freaking use it. And going back to Bruce's right in the beginning, they don't even trust but verify that shit. So, yeah, we all can have a lot of fun with that. The end. All right, so plus 100 for your audience love and energy. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Minus 100 for the rowdy crowd you brought with you. You know, I'm just going to plus 200 to cancel that out because I love you guys. That's awesome. All right, plus 1,000 for mentioning in a neighborly way, POC or get the fuck out. That's a pretty damn good publication. Thank you, neighbor. Um, plus 100, uh, this is a super stealthy Vim executing Python staying out of the process list. Noise. That gets you a noise. Yeah. Um, plus 100 for blue team detection tricks. Noise. Once again, noise. Um, let's see. Plus 1,000 that this was a, an actual technical talk. Thank you so fucking much. Thank you very much. Yes. You already heard me, minus a million Emacs, son, come on. <laughs> All right, no, but that was a fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy yeah. the bye-bye. Next, next year, I want to see the same talk on Nano. <laughs> yeah, come back when you can do it in Pico. All right. Pico's deprecated. Pico.